Um, so my talk today is about, uh, it's a case study, sort of a case study approach to cybersecurity leadership, people with the process and technology crossed out. Um, cover this. Hello, everybody. Hi. Um, ooh. <laughs> Who the hell are you? You mentioned, I'm Jason. Happy to be here. Um, like he said, Chief Information Security Officer, uh, 20 years of tech experience, nine, uh, 20 plus years. I kind of keep it at 20 because I don't want to show that I'm really, really, really old. Um, the last 10, uh, nine, 10 years as a CISO. I'm actually a Bay Area boy, so I have my bachelor's of science from here at University of San Francisco, and I went to Go Ducks, Oregon for my MBA, and then this long list of certifications, et cetera. But you know, um, my passion is really in organizational decision making and leadership. Um, and because he mentioned it, because I live in Los Angeles, it's actually a city ordinance that you must have your own podcast. So to follow the law, I have a podcast called F Sides, and it's all about the human side. Some of the stuff we're going to talk about today. Um, people, process, and technology. We're all familiar that these are the sort of the cornerstone of what we do in security and technology. Uh, let me see a show of hands. Which one of you think, how many of you think that people is the, of, of these three, what's going to make your cybersecurity program successful? Is it people? Raise your hand. Let me see a show of hands. All right. Is it process? Couple of hands here and there. Technology. Shit. All right. <laughs> My, I, I, I think I can go home now <laughs> because you all chose what I think is the right answer. It's all about people. And he, here's why. Here's the problem. For one, cybersecurity is considered a hard science, not a soft science. Everything that we put into for cybersecurity is around technology, it's around the process. We don't focus enough on people. All the training that we go to, we're at one. No offense to the Teleport Conference, because there's some amazing technical stuff they got going on here. But they're all focused on tech. You go to Black Hat, you go to RSA. Very few talks are going to be focused on the people aspect of what we do. Conferences like this, yep, conferences are also like this. So all training is based on tech. All conferences are based on technology, not really a focus on people. And uh, um, when we do focus on people, I think they get a bad rap. We have a lot of questionable frameworks out there, like DISC and Myers-Briggs, which I think was a middle-aged housewife that came up with it in the 40s. You know, these questionable things, and then you do a couple trust falls with HR. Boom, hey, all my, leaders, all my organizational problems are over, and my people are doing great. So I think these are some of the problems. So I want to talk today about um, a case study approach. And if you're going to have one takeaway from today's session, it's going to be this. How your teams make decisions is more important than the decisions themselves. Uh, you might be wondering, well, that's great, Jason. You said you have 20 years of tech. This is like a passion of yours. Oh, you have a podcast. You must be an expert. Why are you, do you think you're validated to talk about this? Uh, everybody have culture amp surveys at their company where they take surveys about, hey, how great are your team? Think about the company. How good does your team think about its management, its leadership, and where the company is going? For the last two organizations I worked for, this was the company average of the score of those culture amps. My team always ranked in the top 90th percentile, consistently over five years of my last organization, four years before that, and then one year at my current organization. So I think I'm doing kind of the right thing with some of the stuff that I'm going to share with you. Um, if you were to come into the middle of this conference, you, you might think you're at a History Channel conference because I'm going to talk a little bit about stuff that typically doesn't have a lot to do with cybersecurity. I'm going to talk about JFK and the Bay of Pigs and the Cuban Missile Crisis. I'm going to talk about the Devil's Advocacy Program with the Catholic Church. I'm going to talk about Google and street hockey, and I'm going to talk about Mount Everest. And I'm going to do it by sharing with you four case studies, or four historical sort of studies, four things that happened in history. I'm going to give you two dysfunctions, and then I'm going to give you sort of 10 quick takeaways that I think you could start in the next couple of weeks, at least take some of these things to start you know, doing something with them. Let's start with the story of the Bay of Pigs. In, yeah, in April 61, there was this failed attack launched by the CIA during the Kennedy administration to push uh, the Cuban leader Fidel, uh, Fidel Castro from power. On 61, the CIA launched what they thought was going to be the definitive mood. About 1,400 American-trained uh, Cubans invaded Cuba, with, invaded Cuba with, the, with the opportunity to overthrow Castro. It was a complete fiasco. Most of the rebels were killed or captured. And it actually grew Fidel's internal prestige within Cuba and probably led to what's going to happen next. It led probably to the Russians putting, Cuban, putting nuclear missiles into Cuba. 
Uh, who's familiar with an after action review? All right, it, it, it's a military term, but it's basically it's the improvement process or the recovery process and in incident response when you sit around and you go, all right, what did we do well? What did we do bad? And how can we improve and how can we get better? If you're going to do an AAR after this Bay of Pigs crisis and say, all right, what was the decision making? How did we, how did we end up where we were? You might find these things. Um, for one, they met in the cabinet room. The decision making group that said this is what we're going to do for the, for the Bay of Pigs and try to throw Fidel was they met in the cabinet room. This is going to come up later, why, why that's important. The CIA played the role of both the, <laughs> the evaluator and the advocate. So not only were they advocating for a solution, but they were the ones evaluating how good that solution was. The decision-making process was veiled in secrecy. It wasn't out in the open. It wasn't very transparent. Key experts in the administration, people that knew a lot about Cuba and not about the military, were you know, kind of like hesitant to discuss it. There was no candid dialogue taking place. People were holding back their concerns or their commentary. Assumptions were running rampant. No one was challenging them. The CIA dominated the meeting. The Joint Chiefs of Staff, which are the heads of the military, were oddly remaining silent. The CIA was kind of running the show in this decision-making process. No alternatives were given. It was seen as a binary go or no-go decision. Rank and hierarchy, how high up the food chain you were, played a very large role in the decision-making process. And there were some cognitive biases in effect. One is the sunk cost bias, where if you invest so much in something, you think that because you put that much money into it, you got to keep continuing with it. That was also at play here. So let's jump about a year and a half later. It's Kennedy's lucky term as president. Well, that goes without saying. Unlucky term as president, because 18 months later, the Russians put a bunch of missiles into Cuba. And the leaders of the US and the Soviet Union were in this, you've heard of 13 days, in this intense 13-day political standoff because of these missiles just 90 miles from the US shore. On October 22nd of 62, JFK notified the Americans about the presence of these missiles, and he explained what they were going to do about it. He said, we're going to do a naval blockade and try to negotiate our way out of this. This was probably the closest the world has come to war. Disaster ended up being avoided because the actual naval blockade worked. It was a great decision. Uh, Khrushchev agreed and said, okay, we're going to withdraw our missiles for the promise that the U.S. would never invade Cuba. Now, if you do the after action review on this, Kennedy specifically changed almost everything about how his group made this decision. So if you do an AAR looking at the Cuban Missile Crisis from the previous decision making, he changed it completely. For one thing, they met in the State Department. Before I mentioned they met in the cabinet room. The reason being is that when you sit in the cabinet room, you sit by hierarchy. Secretary of State sits at the head of the table. Secretary of Defense, Secretary of Agriculture, he's lucky if they let him on the White House grounds. So it's very hierarchical just by the sitting arrangement. State Department is like the King Arthur and the round table. Everyone just sits wherever, you're all equal, which is the reason why it's the round table with King Arthur. If you didn't know that, it was because he felt that, hey, I'm equal with all the knights sitting at the table. He formed this group. Um, he called it XCOM. And at the time, there were two prevailing ideas that were floating up. So he got everybody together. He called this group XCOM. They were the decision-making powers. And he split them off into two groups. One group was going to say one of the prevailing ideas was a naval blockade. The other was an airstrike. And then he had those two groups create white papers. He had one write a white paper on, this is why we think the naval blockade, the other one on the airstrike, and even had them share white papers. It's like you're back in college. Write a white paper, give me an essay, share the essay over here and redline it. And he'd make the team share each other's opinion and white papers with each other. Um, he then also assigned, specifically assigned the role of devil's advocate. He assigned his brother Bobby Kennedy, who is attorney general, I think. Bobby Kennedy is a devil's advocate and a guy named Theodore Sorensen. And it was their sole purpose to go poke holes in what that team was coming up with. And I'm going to get to Devil's Advocate later, a little more in depth. Kennedy chose also not to participate in the meetings. Really key because he thought that he'd get more frank discussion out of the team. People were supposed to speak even if it wasn't their area of expertise. And he invited outside, unbiased experts to join in the conversation and the decision making. He had teams write a speech as the US 
as the president to the United States backing up their decision. Think of that. How many times have we make decisions in cyber, we make decisions in IT, but then maybe you have to go to your shareholders or go to your customer base as a CEO and write why do we make that decision? Puts a good uh, frame set of what is really at stake for the business or for the government, or in his, ca his case, the United States citizens. And another key, rules of protocol were suspended. Everybody was considered equal. There was no rank in the room. Everything was great. The naval blockade, along with diplomatic, it ultimately, diplomatic efforts, ultimately resolved the conflict. Missiles are removed from Cuba, and the world's on the brink of war. comes back to peace. So how does these two stories apply to cybersecurity? Well, it, it doesn't get much more <laughs> high stakes than global thermonuclear war. You can just ask Whopper. Anybody get that reference? Show me my age group, yes. War Games, one of the original hacking movies. Um, it, Cause it's all about trust, how you instill trust in your team, giving psychological safety for your team to be able to disagree, and then having that disagreement of conflict and debate. Because how your teams make decisions is more important than the decisions themselves. I mentioned earlier the devil's advocate. Let's talk a little about the devil's advocate. Late in the 16th century, uh, Pope Clement the sixth, seventh, need my glasses. Um, he started the secret canonization process for this dude named Lawrence Justinian. Now, this guy, everyone was on board with this guy becoming a pope. Like this guy, he gave up his wealth, he gave up his nobility. He was like a righteous guy, and everybody, the way it would work is everybody from the local village would vote, would say, yes, we want this guy to be pope, and everybody was on board with this. Problem was, uh, Pope Clement's predecessor, Pope Leo X, thought, you know what, I don't think becoming a saint should be so easy. I think it should be kind of a big deal. So he created this role. And he also knew um, with that whole, he knew that there was this, another cognitive bias at work called confirmation bias. That's the bias where you only find information to back up your pre-existing belief. And he knew, that, he knew that this was running rampant with the Pope selection process. Guy comes from your hometown, dude, he gave up his pot, gave up, yeah, he, of course he's the, he's the best thing for Pope. So Pope Leo X knew this and he created this, this role, he realized his bias of play, and he wanted to protect the church from saints who didn't deserve to be saints. So he assigned a priest to argue against every candidate for statehood. This role was called a promoter of the faith. Think about that. You think about devil's advocate, sometimes it has a negative connotation to it. Like, well, you're just, all you're doing is arguing for arguing's sake. It's actually not what the role was created for. It was to promote the faith of the church. It was to protect the church from people who didn't deserve to be saints. To give you some perspective, over a thousand year period of having the devil's advocacy in place from about a thousand to what is that, 1978, about 450 men and women were canonized. In 83, Pope John Paul II, he retired the position of the devil's advocacy, and over his reign, wait, reign is not the right word, over his tenure of about 25 years, over 480 saints have been canonized since they removed that control, process, that control in, in place. Now, I'm not saying these 480 people don't deserve to be saints, but wow, 1,000 years, 450, and 25 years, 480. So how does this apply to cybersecurity? Who is your devil's advocate? Is your team challenging each other? Are assumptions being made? Is there a confirmation bias at play in some of your group decisions making, decision makings? And is it safe for the team even to do so? How your teams make decisions is more important than the decisions themselves. My next story is about a guy named Sid Caesar and your show of shows. Um, you see, anybody know this show or have heard of it? Hey, more of my age group. This is great. Uh, Saturday Night Live, throw a hand up. I think I just showed the whole of my sweater, too. Um, this is the predecessor to Saturday Night Live of all skit shows. It was in the 50s, and it, it had some of the most amazing and talented writers of our generation. You may recognize some of these names. Mel Brooks, Woody Allen, Carl Reiner. These were all writers on this show. And it was the most popular show at the time. It was number one in the Nielsen ratings, five, six years straight. Uh, Neil Simon, too, he's a great Broadway playwright. He was also in that writer's room. These guys fought, they argued, ideas flowed. It got so bad with the arguments that one time they hung a voodoo doll of Mel Brooks in effigy 
because they disagreed with what he was trying to come up with the skit from this lamp. But these guys were best friends afterwards. They'd go out for, for drinks, they'd go out for dinner. It was a tight group. But when they were debating cognitive conflict debates about the topic, some of the most creative stuff came out of this show. Getting teams to channel emotions that brings out task-oriented and not interpersonal conflict is good. Cognitive conflict is great for teams. Affective conflict is bad. How does this apply to cybersecurity? Creativity in cyber? No. Come on, we're not creative. We don't do that. Uh, shenanigans. Anyone who says cybersecurity doesn't require copious amounts of creativity, you don't know cyber very well. Does every one of your team input when it comes into technical debates? Remember back to the JFK, he said, everybody must have a say, everybody needs a voice. Are you getting a voice from everyone in your team regardless of their area of expertise? Are you using debate and conflict to flush out new ideas and new creative thinking? How your teams make decisions is more important than the decisions themselves. My last story is about these ads sucking. Um, in, in the early 2000s, there was a race to build a software engine that connected search with targeted ads. This company, Overture, based in where I live now, Los Angeles, was by far the overwhelming favorite. If you asked anybody in tech, anybody in, anybody in Wall Street, who's going to win this race? It's Overture. It was well-funded. It was uh, led by the guy who invented pay-per-click, this, pay this guy named Bill Gross. By far, they had, the, they had the, the resources, the intelligence to win. They didn't. I think we all know who did win. A small, young startup company called Google won. And arguably, how they won and when they won, when they won, can be tied back to their kitchen at their original uh, Bayshore Parkway address. And it was because Google founder Larry Page stuck these words to the kitchen wall. These ads suck. And it's all about street hockey, town halls, and culture. Larry Page isn't your traditional businessman. He wasn't your traditional businessman. He might be now, 25 years later. Um, his leadership style was to have these sustained, long, drawn out, no holds barred debates on technology and strategy. To work at Google was to enter this continuous fray or continuous wrestling match. It carried over into the street hockey games. They'd have street hockey back when they were small. They'd have a street, annual street hockey, a weekly street hockey game on Fridays out in the parking lot. You were expected to fight for the puck with Larry. You weren't supposed to hold back as he's the CEO. It extended into their town halls. They'd have weekly town halls. And anybody was expected to challenge the owners and the founders on any technical concept, strategic concept. You, it was expected of you to challenge each other. Google's engine in this race between Overture was called AdWords, but it sucked. <laughs> if you were looking for a Kawasaki H1B motorcycle, you were getting results for an H1B visa. It was terrible. So Page was tired of this, so they weren't getting anywhere. They knew they had a problem. He printed out all these bad examples of the search results, stacked them up, and stacked them on the kitchen wall and put this thing that said, these ads suck. In walk in this guy named Jeff Dean to get a cappuccino on a Friday afternoon. You know, it wasn't his problem to solve. He worked over in, I think he worked in search. He took it, no particular motivation, but because he felt safe doing so. He felt like an owner. He felt like he contributed. He felt like he had a say in what goes on at the company. He grabbed it, didn't ask for permission. He just did it. Worked on it over the weekend. He, had, he said, I seem to remember something like this a couple years ago. His fix ended up working. In the year after, profits went from $6 million to $99 million. And by 2014, AdWords was, you know, they're Google, $160 million a day. Uh, race over. They won. How does this story apply to cybersecurity? Trust and conflict gets you psychological safety, which gets you buy-in and ownership from your team. Google won not because it was smarter, it was more well-funded. They won because they were safer. How open is the decision-making process on your teams? Are you inviting conflict and debate from everyone across your organization? Are your leaders of technical experts being challenged? And are they comfortable with being challenged? Can anyone 
do anything? Or are you locked into strict roles and responsibilities? Do you only allow your analysts to analyze? Is GRC only doing GRC? Because how your teams make decisions is more important than the decisions themselves. Let's talk two dysfunctions. If you haven't read this book, I highly recommend it in the same way that NIST CSF maps to almost every framework out there for cybersecurity. You're going to find that five dysfunctions maps to every single, maps to multipliers, maps to all these other stuff you're going to see. It's kind of like a base. Um, and it basically says it's, it's a really great book because it's a, it's a story. We love stories as human beings, right? It's a story. And it gives you these, says there's these five things that keep teams from functioning well. Um, this book isn't just me either. It's used by almost every major corporation in the world, from Google to Microsoft, uh, Atlassian, Apple, the NFL. And there's five. It starts with, uh, if your team is dysfunctioning, they don't trust each other. And if you can't trust each other, you can't conflict and debate and come to a good decision-making process. And then there's three more. You lack a commitment, accountability, and results. Remember I said two dysfunctions. I really think for the large, vast majority of you, and for me too, you got to focus on the first two. Those are the hardest and will get you the most results. So I'm going to talk about trust and conflict. Trust. It's the foundation of any team, from the Navy SEALs to what we saw in XCOM from JFK to your cybersecurity teams. Do you trust your teammates? Do you trust your leader? Some behaviors and traits that build trust are going to be vulnerability. Are you showing vulnerability as a teammate and a team leader? Are you transparent and honest in your communications and what you're sharing about them? Are you authentic? Are you open? Are you showing empathy? And are you making it okay to fail? Fear removal. Everything comes down to you as either a leader or a team member. You can't say, oh, my leader's not doing it. It starts with you. If you're the leader, oh, it definitely starts with you. As Yoda once said, one offsite does not a trusting team make. This is a direct quote. Conflicts. Cybersecurity teams are under incredible, immense pressure to, make good, to be good decision makers. How many of you are involved in incident response? OK, I got some more hands. Great. If you're in incident response, you, you, sometimes you, you have to make the right decisions. And the more says and the more, more people you have involved in that in decision making process, the better it's going to be. If decisions about how to apply a limited resource to maximize risk or during incidents or the fog of war, these are decisions that are critical. If you want good decisions and you want creative ideas, constructive conflict and debate are absolutely required. One of my favorite quotes is Barry Rand, the former CEO of Avis. He says, if I have a yes man working for me, one of us is redundant. All right, let's give you a quick 10 takeaways, 10 things that I think you can get started on today or tomorrow or next week. And I'm going to start each one with a quote. It's not finance, not strategy, not technology. It's teamwork that remains the ultimate competitive advantage, both because it is so powerful and so rare. This is Patrick Lencioni. He's the author of The Five Dysfunctions of a Team and a couple other cool books. So guess what that is? Go read Five Dysfunctions of a Team. Great read, story, it's short. I swear it's a framework that you're just going to probably live by. I read it 15 years ago, maybe, and I still everything I learn applies to that. And um, read it, and if you have a few team members, uh, who, who, new team members who join, guess what? <laughs> Be Oprah. You get a book. You get a book. You get a book. It isn't a one and done. I'm going to go back to that one and done theme later. And for those Gen Zs or A's who don't know what books are, <laughs> there's manga versions. You can get the audio book. There might even be a YouTube video on it. Okay? So that's not an excuse being a Gen Z or Gen A-er. Um, this is going to be the foundation for everything you're going to want to build as a team. What gets measured gets improved. Peter Drucker is a famous management consultant. So all of you metrics lovers like I am, this is key. There is a great, if you read The Five Dysfunctions, the authors offer this. You, can, you, can, you don't think you even need to buy it. You can just run it yourself. But this great survey. It's about 35 questions. It gives you a baseline of how well your team is performing on these five dysfunctions. It's easy, and, and it's actually very, um, very accurate and very pragmatic. So I highly recommend you take it. And then you'll use that to say, oh, wow, look where we're weak on. Maybe you have a high-functioning team. It'll tell you that. I came into my new company now, and it was 
yellow, green, red. It was like yellow and green. I was pretty impressed. I'm like, wow. But it still finds some areas that you, can, that you can work on to improve. So I highly recommend you take it. And then you do it year over year. Because it needs to become that repetition and that practice and part of your culture. Talent wins games, but teamwork and intelligence win championships. Michael Jordan, duh. Get off your site, AKA offsites. Familiar with offsites? Get your team out of the office. Dedicate time during the offsite, not just for strategy, not just for technical, but for your team. You should focus at least 50% of that time on cultural development. It can be as simple as a five dysfunctions review. It can be some of the case studies that I'm going to share in a slide coming up. We were a team in name only, I'd sadly come to realize. Although in a few hours, we would leave camp as a group, we would ascend as individuals, linked to one another, one another by neither rope nor by any deep sense of loyalty. This is from John Krakauer. He wrote a great book on a uh, fate, fateful, um, tragic 1996 Mount Everest climb, where about eight climbers died, including the guides. Um, amazing book and a good case study in leadership and a great story. And I say tip number four is go climb Mount Everest. Now, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> I mean, go climb Mount Everest. Um, Forio.com offers a simulation, a virtual simulation. It's one of those interactive things you can do as a team. Um, to climb Mount Everest. The great thing about it is it's based on and built by that, it's based on that 1996 climb. There was a famous Harvard Business Review case study written by it, written by the co-author who started the Froyo simulation. So it's all based on the Harvard Business, it's based on the 96 climb, and it's just an awesome way to get your team out of cyber, to make them think about something besides technology, and get them into sort of a real world example of leadership and teamwork and it covers a lot of cognitive biases. It'll cover uh, confirmation bias, overconfidence, sunk cost effect, and it works really well in just a couple hours. And instead of just standing up and listening to people like me talk or to somebody PowerPoint you to death, it's a great exercise. And guess what? Five dysfunctions of a team applies. We do not learn from experience. We learn from reflecting on experience. This is John Dewey, this uh, cool philosopher and psychologist. Use case studies. They're great for, don't take my word for it. Like I've been talking up here, I said, hey, look, look at my scores for my thing. Yeah. Use case studies, man. They bridge the gap between this theoretical idea of what you should be doing, which is like disc Myers-Briggs or some of these, what color is your parachute? Some you know, fluffy stuff that's actually, hey, look what they really did. Google, that's a great case study story. I gave you a very shortened version of it, but there's a lot more there to it of why Google was such an awesome company back in the day and how that let them succeed. And like I mentioned before, human beings, we're storytelling animals. You know, stories just really impact us. Part of being a CISO is you got to be a good storyteller. Uh, some recommendations, I think they'll share the deck here. The Man Gulch Fire of 1949 about a bunch of smoke jumpers that uh, perished. Great case study in leadership and how we look at ourselves in cyber and how we associate with our tools. Um, extreme Ownership, the entire book, it's about Navy SEALs. Literally every chapter is a case study of leadership in battle. It's awesome. Anything by Greg Popovich, you understand how he leads the Spurs. Is he still coach of the Spurs? Yes, right? Yes. He's awesome. He's got some great stories about his leadership. And the Draper Coffin story is a guy who uh, kind of started the Navy SEAL is another great, so some sample case study stuff. A team is not a group of people that work together. A team is a group of people that trust each other. Got to build trust. It's so easy for me to stand up here and tell you, build trust, build trust. You gotta share your vulnerabilities, man. And it's hard, it's hard. I'm a dude, you know, it's hard for me to open up, share, but it's gonna, it's gonna take emotions. It's gonna take you being authentic, setting the example, saying one way I do it is, a, I think I'll get to it later, is I share my failures and I show that, hey, I'm vulnerable. I, I make mistakes just like you might. Be transparent, transparency builds trust. I follow this with all of my teams. I call it my framework is the three C's. Communicate, communicate, communicate. I email everybody on almost everything. I want to Slack the entire group. I share with the group what I'm thinking, what I'm working on, what I'm working on with another team. Communicate, communicate, communicate. If people come back and say, oh, it's too much email, get a filter. Okay? I'd rather 
over communicate than under communicate. And when you're ready and you've started down this path, you can look this up later. I highly recommend you conduct a very hearty start, stop, continue exercise. There are good ways to do this and not so great ways. If you want to know, I'll be around for about an hour. Come hit me up. I'm happy to share with you how this can really be work. But it's not something you want to start with on day one. It can be, I've had employees cry from this. But it's a very vulnerable, open exercise with your team, and I highly recommend it. We need to accept that we don't always make the right decisions, that we'll screw up royally sometimes, understanding that failure is not the opposite of success. It's part of success. Ariana Huffington, CEO of Thrive Global and HuffPost, creator. Fear removal. You got you to gotta get rid of your team uh, being afraid to fail. Part of the trust is instilling psychological safety within your team. Fear of failure is just its a psychological safety killer. If people are afraid to fail, they're not going to want to speak up. They're not going to make a wrong decision. You need to make it OK and safe and even expected to fail. Make supporting failure the norm. If you, someone says, hey, how they failed, you support it, you call it out, and you thank the members of the team for sharing the failure. Um, get the ball rolling if you're the leader or a member just by sharing your own. And remember not to focus on the person, but you focus on the causes of the error. If you're looking for a way to improve, you don't say, wow, you should have done that. You say, oh, what was the decision-making process? How did it lead to that? And oh, here's how you know, we as a team can make a decision better in the future. I do this, I mentioned this, I think I mentioned this, I do this in every other uh, weekly all-team meeting uh, with, our man with my management. We do a whoops, I did it again. Yeah, I'm a Brittany fan. I do whoops, I did it again, and we all start off the meeting with a failure that we had in the last two weeks that we made. So I'll say something I screwed up at. I say, yep, I had that audit committee and I blew up at, at, at legal. I shouldn't have. My amygdala got a hold of me. Anybody have that? <laughs> blow up at legal? No, it's, it's not fun. It is better to debate a question without settling it than to settle a question without debating it. This is Joseph Dober. He's a French moralist and essayist. I really like this quote. Conflict and debate. Ensure conflict and debate are expected. Use the devil's advocate role. Install one on your team and say, hey, you know, whoever your number two is, or even anybody, say, hey, can you, would you feel comfortable playing devil's advocate? Start off doing it yourself. Be the one, because then it shows the example. And then it becomes part of your lexicon and your culture, where I swear in my last company, the most overused term was, the team would say to each other, if I could play devil's advocate for this, because it made it OK to disagree with someone. You have the technical expert that knows most about Azure AD, and you're like, oh, I'm not going to go up against them. Like, well, wait a minute. I read that one article about this. They can safely say, Hey, if I could play devil's advocate real quick, I read this article that said this. And it challenges those assumptions that we all fall trapped to. Um, and then thank people when you hear debate and conflict. Like, man, that was great. Thank you, for, thank you for disagreeing with me. Thank you for disagreeing with that. I'm glad that we got that to the surface. Don't act like you forgot. <laughs> I call the shot, shot, shots, like bra, bra, bra. Pay me what you owe me. Don't act like you forgot. All right, I hope I went down a couple generations with this one. Okay. This is a Be Better Have My Money by Rihanna. Uh, be your own Rihanna. Be your own boss. Be your own CEO. Be your own HR department. Don't wait for HR to build your team or build the culture on your team or look for their direction. You own your team, whether you're a member or the leader or a manager. Leaders don't need to be, don't need to have the title. Use five dysfunctions. Like I said, it's like NIST CSF. It's, it maps to everything. Run your team your way, build your team with your culture. You don't have to be the manager to be the leader. And lastly, repetition is the mother of learning, the father of action, which makes it the architect of accomplishment. Rinse, wash, rinse and repeat. It takes seven times for an employee typically to remember something. So if you just throw five dysfunctions at them and you leave it, great, we're done, we're great. It doesn't work that way. Cybersecurity is a program, right? It's not a one and done. Neither is building your team culture. Through repetition of behavior, you're going to create team norms. You're going to make your teams feel safe every day. That's what you should repeat. Make them feel safe. Make them feel comfortable. Show trust every day. And then rinse and repeat. Because how your teams make decisions is more important than the decisions themselves. Thank you. Uh, these are some of the references. I think they might have the slides later. Some of the references. There's also, as I'm walking off the stage, and again, another I'm a fan of not taking my word for it. 
uh, there was a huge Department of Homeland Security, George Mason, Dartmouth, Sweden, and the Netherlands. It's the largest social behavior uh, study on inf information security teams to date. It took five years, 20 plus researchers. It's a great paper. It's featured in SAN's uh, Blueprint podcast, episode 29. And they found these things. The problems were there's a failure to share unique information on incident response information security teams. Poor communication, there's a lack of trust. Interpersonal, not cognitive conflict, and many more caused incidents and cybersecurity incidents to go bad. So I'm not making this up. This does apply to cybersecurity. Thanks. <laughs>